Well, I'll say this as Marcel gets it together. You know, we kind of we, we we're still kind of modifying what it looks like up here. And uh, uh, this is the second week that we've had the clear podium. I'm used to having something in front of us. And you almost caught me off guard last week. And so now I got to get wear some good pants. You <laughs> can see me now. Oh man, come really wear a suit up here and have some sweats down here. <laughs> 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 yeah, you're gonna keep me on my toes now. Get some new pants and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but yeah, we're glad to be able to do that. It, it, it helps us be more transparent. <laughs> was that what? Was that? Ah, quotation of the day. Marcel snuck that on me. I'm just gonna get back there for you. Though. We always have a quotation for the day. Something for you to think about before we get into the scripture. This is Francis Bacon. It says, the wonder of a single snowflake outweighs the wisdom of a million meteorologists. Amen. That's oh. right. <laughs> the wonder of a single snowflake outweighs the wisdom of a million meteorologists. Amen. Sometimes I wonder what they get paid for. I can go outside and tell you it's going to rain. Well, I don't get paid for it, though. I need to do what they do. I get paid for it, I guess. No, it's true. But, yeah, have you ever looked at a snowflake under the microscope? Beautiful. I mean, it's like looking at it through a kaleidoscope to have a crystal swarm. I mean, you can't help but acknowledge that there is a God. Amen. That's right. Looking at a snowflake. All right. Since you have your Bibles with you, I might go a little southpaw on you from what's written on the screen last minute, but bear with me. I'd like for you to open up to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's stand to our feet when you get there. I'll know that you're at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, by your standing to your feet. Now, I know on the screen it has 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But rather than turn into that, you can write that down. These are the, the, the uh, foundational scriptures that we're using for the second part of today's message. I want you to go rather than... Second Timothy. I want you to go to Romans chapter 8, if you would. Romans chapter 8. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. Write down 2 Timothy chapter 1. But I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. Don't lose your place at Ephesians chapter 1. Romans It'll make what? sense. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Romans eight. And Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. Okay? Now what you're about to look at, or what we're gonna what we're gonna see looking at these two verses of scripture, 2 Timothy is the one that you're gonna look at later on at your own convenience. But uh, uh, what we're gonna be looking at is God's seven-stage plan for mankind. And they're listed, how we've ended up listing them, we listed them in, in the order of sequence, how they go, the natural order that they come in. And we're gonna be later on looking at these, these stages in more detail. Amen? Amen? Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to go there first. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. All right? There's a list that's taking place that you can see going on right there. Now I want you to flip over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son." that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for today's message that you provided in my heart for this flock, your people. Thank you for those who are in earshot of this message. I pray that your word will go forth and it will prosper in the very thing in which you sent it. We thank you that it will bring forth fruit because of hearing and receiving and doing your word. 
And Lord, we thank you for confirming your word with the appropriate signs and wonders to follow. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And those in agreement said, Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. <laughs> Now, just for the sake of uh, of the presence of that scripture on, on board, I told you you can look at that later. I'll read this to you uh, just so that we'll have that included in the group so we'll go into our, our discussion a little better. But 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, uh, of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Amen, that's right. All right? So uh, with those three passages of Scripture we just looked at, uh, we're looking at a perfect picture of God's plan for mankind. And this plan unfolds itself in seven stages. Everyone say seven stages. Seven stages. Seven stages. It's interesting that God would use seven, isn't it? No, seven, the number of completion. Seven is the day that God rested and man went into his rest with, with God, you see? Uh, uh, so that from that standpoint before, before the fall, see, work didn't come with the fall. <laughs> you see, work was here before the fall. So work is not a curse. What came with the fall was sweat. Yeah. It was sweat that came with the fall. Sore muscles, back aches. See, all that kind of stuff comes with the fall. You might love what you're doing. You know what I mean? But what you're doing can kill you if you do it too long. <laughs> you see, because of the curse of the fall. But when God made man on the sixth day, the seventh day he rested, and they both went into God's rest together. So man is designed to work from a standpoint of rest, if you can imagine that. Uh, we're working from a standpoint of rest. But seven, being the number of completion, He's given us a seven-stage plan that as we look at it under the microscope, you'll better understand who you are and what your destiny is in Christ. Amen? Amen. Uh, this would be the picture that we're, that we're looking at. And I'll just give you the overview of the, that, that list, those, that seven-stage plan. We've looked at already the first three last week. Uh, the first three, he, number one, foreknew us. Number two, he called us, I'm sorry, he chose us. He foreknew us, number one. Number two, he chose us. Number three, he pre predestined us. He predestined us. Now, we stopped with number three. Didn't go into number four because the first three had to deal with before time. You see that? So where we are now with, with the last four in part two, we move out from time and into eternity. I'm sorry, we move out from, I, I got it backwards, we move out from eternity, and now we're moving into time. This is where we are. This is where man's domain is. See, God has given the earth to the children of men, but eternity belongs to him. Heaven belongs to him. We dominate the earth. So the salvation that he's provided for us has to be relevant to where we live. Mm -hmm. We live here in time. How many, how many of you live in time? Everybody should raise their hand. You know, if you don't live in time, that means you've already gone on to be with the Lord. Hopefully. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 just because you've gone on doesn't necessarily mean you've gone on to be with the Lord. But it does mean that you've left time and you've gone into eternity. You've gone on into eternity. So now we're moving out from eternity where he foreknew us, where he chose us, where he predestined us. And we're moving now into time. Which brings us to number four, stage number four. Let's dive right in. Number four, God called us. God called us. I hope you're taking good notes because I have three PowerPoints for you to, to walk away with today. And as I've always said before, I want you to walk away not with just a knowledge of God's word, but I want you to have a, a working knowledge of his word. I want you to see the relevance of your call. See, number four, God called us. God called us. Uh, but I want you to make note of something that this is, uh, 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 as far as the call is concerned, there's a very important moment in each of our lives, a very important moment that all of us uh, have to face. And I'm not talking about the point of death, but what I am talking about is at that point at which the eternal purpose of God impacts us individually. That's the most important moment in our lives. God has an eternal purpose. He has an eternal plan. But it means nothing unless it impacts us individually. 
Would you agree with that? It has to impact our lives individually. That's the most important point in our lives. Now, how does it work? He called us. How does it work? But well, as God calls us, as he calls us, his purpose comes out of eternity and into time and then into our lives. He comes into our lives. He calls us from eternity into our lives. This is why we can say that there are two sides to, to God's plan. You can't say, you know, there are seven stages, but there are two sides. You have a legal side and you have a practical side. You see, God saved us in Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at that a little bit more in, in the future, but I want to just use it as an example for right now. See, when you look at the salvation that God has provided for us in Jesus Christ, it's a total salvation, which we're going to look at also a little later. It's a, a complete salvation. From God's perspective, he sees every individual as being saved already. He can legally do so because of what he did in Christ Jesus. I know what you're saying, but what did he do in Christ Jesus that makes it legal for God to call all of us saved? I'm glad you asked. Here's what he did. He took all of mankind, because all of mankind deserves death. Amen, that's all right. Of us deserve death. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's right. You see, the glory of God is, is, is love, and that doesn't originate with mankind. We're, we're, born, uh, we're born into this world selfish. And because we are <coughs> self for self, that causes self-destruction. So all of us deserves death. Here's what God did in his genius and his wisdom. What God did was he, take, he took all of mankind and he put all of mankind in the one man, Jesus. You see that? And in the one man, Jesus, for one point, at one point in time in history, he judges all mankind once and for all. Come on, tell you it. see that? Since he did it once and for all, now he can legally, from his angle, from his side, he can say that he saved all of us. Amen, that's right. He saved us all. But that's the legal side. Now, that's from eternity. In time, we hear the message preached. And when we hear the message preached, we've come to that moment in history where in our life it's the most important part, part of our life. His eternal plan meets my individual life, and I respond to it. You see, when I respond to it, that's the practical side. I'm basically responding to what he legally did already. Amen, that's right. That's it. So I say, Christ saved us. Do you accept that salvation? Yes, I do. Do you accept him as your Lord? Yes, I do. Now, individually and actively, you have now invoked what legally already took place. So you have the practical side and you have the legal side. You see? The legal side, you can tell everybody, Christ saved you. Now, not everybody will believe that and act on that, so it won't always impact someone individually, not until they respond right but do you see the, the, the point of what I'm saying? There's two sides to his salvation, the legal and the practical side. You see? So there are two meanings of the word to call. Now, we're saying that this stage number four is he called us. There are two meanings of the verb to call. Now, verb means action. It's an action word. When he calls us, that is an action from God's side. But here's what the two meanings mean, and we're going to put this together. <coughs> to call means, uh, the verb to call, to call, excuse me. It means to invite. It means to invite. It also means to summons. To invite and to summon. So write this down as your first PowerPoint. Hey, Jim, I see you sneaking in, Sean. Snuck in here on like that. It ain't fair. You come in while I'm talking. First PowerPoint for today. God's calling is an invitation, but also carries with it all the authority of a king's summons. See that? See, it's not a coincidence that all of us are here today. The crowd that we have today, the combination of people that we have today, this is a summons by the king himself. You think you came because you were invited. Well, that was part of it, but God called you here today. He called you here for this particular message. He may have called you here for this particular message so that you can link to, to a lot of messages to come. You see? We don't know what he's, what he's called to do, but we're called individually to do our part. He gives us our own individual roles, our own individual part to play in his plan. But his calling is an invitation, number one, but it's also a summons by a king. It's a summons by the king himself. Amen? Which brings us to number five. I'm going to move through here kind of quick. Number five. See, number four is God called us. Number five, God saved us. Mm -hmm. God saved us. Now, I've already given you a little bit about 
the salvation of God. You know that it's twofold. It's legal from his side and it's practical from our side. Uh, we saw it with Mary when she received uh, uh, the message from Gabriel. You remember? She said, he said that to, to Mary, you're going to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. He's going to come on you. You're going to, you're going to uh, uh, give birth to a son. She's a virgin, but she's going to give birth to a son, and his name shall be Jesus. Now, he gave her the message, but you don't see anything take place until after she says something. She says, so be it unto me according to your word. Then it says, then the angel left. That always fascinates me. Because the angel spoke to her for a while, but then he sat, sat there for a minute just waiting on her response. And it wasn't until the angel left, or I'm sorry, until she gave the right response that the angel left. It wasn't until she said, so be it unto me, according to your word. That's when Paul wrote, uh, of course, all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. Are yes and amen. From God's side, the legal side, it's yes. He's already done it, so it's yes from his side. He doesn't desire that any perish. He wants everybody to be saved. So does God want you to be saved? He says, yes, eternally from his side because it's legally done. If, same way with healing. If God has legally provided healing for everybody. Does he want everybody to be healed? The answer from his side is yeah. what? Yes. 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 yes, because it's legal from his side. He's already provided it. But from our side, we have to respond. And when we respond, that's when God can carry out, carry out his will in your life. The will of God in Mary's life was stated to her by the angel Gabriel, but it wasn't carried out until she responded. She said, so be it unto me, according to your word. That's the same as saying amen to the promise of God. You see? The promise is given and legally is given to her, but practically she has to respond with amen or so be it unto me. So anytime you come up to a promise of God, know that from God's side, it's yes. You find the promise. All you have to do from your side is say amen to that promise. And now God can work his will out of your life. Are you getting that? Amen. amen. That makes sense. So amen. God saved us. God saved us. So how does that work? How does it work? Well, we know now that, that God's calling is an invitation or a summons, right? Here's how it works. We were invited or summoned to join God's family through faith in Jesus Christ. We joined God's family because of the invitation given to us. All of us who are in the family of God are just those who responded to the invitation by saying, Amen. Amen. You see, Amen. we said thank you to that. And we came into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But note this, that at the positive response to that call, God saved us, and that's when we entered into salvation. That's right. You see? When we responded positively to the call, that's when we entered into salvation. So we can say that God saved us at that point. At that point, we positively responded to that call. So, as we were saved, we were saved from sin. This is what we were saved from since we were saved. Now, you're saved from one thing to another. Most of the time, we get it that we're saved and now we're going to heaven. But what were we saved from? Not just hell. Uh, 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 and that's, that's only a byproduct. Really, what you were saved from was sin. That's right. Come on. You see, that sin is what you were saved from. Sin is what destroys us. Sin separates us from God. You were saved from your separation from Him. So let me give you this, uh, and I won't charge you for it. See, all the religions of the world, all the religions of the world is man's attempt to build a bridge to God's side. And unfortunately, no one of us, no one religion can reach God from our side. So what God has done in the good news or the gospel is God has built a bridge from his side to us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. How did he do it? He did it through his son, Jesus. Amen. That's right. You see that? That's why Jesus can say this, John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Amen. Father except by me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He didn't, say, he didn't say no man comes to heaven by me. He says no man comes to the Father. So, so it's, it's, it's actually wrong when we preach heaven to people. Although, every, who doesn't want to go to heaven? You know what I mean? Who doesn't want to go to heaven? Everybody wants to go to heaven. There's a million ways to go to heaven. You see? But it's only one way to the Father. You see? You go to heaven by, you know, drowning in a bus, you know, natural causes. I said drowning in a bus. <laughs> <laughs> Just see if you're paying attention. <laughs> uh, you crash in a boat. You know, I flip flop and see it. Yeah. That was on the news earlier, by the way. Somebody did die in a crash, a boat crash, <laughs> you know, a, a speed boat crash. And, 
and then it turned over a tragic accident, but that's a, that's a way you can go to heaven too. You know? <laughs> but there's only one way to the Father. That's the point that I'm making, and it's through the Son, Jesus Christ. So what God is really after is not you going to heaven. He's after you reconnecting with God, reconnecting with himself. He's always desired fellowship with us, not because he was lonely, but, you know, God was, he was, he's the original society. I don't know if you realize that or not. You know, when God said, let us make man in our image, that shows that he's the original society. He didn't need any of us to be complete in himself. But he wanted us, and he desires fellowship with us. Sin separated us from him. So what God did as a grace to us, is we don't have to try to build a bridge to him. He's already come to us in his, in, in his son. Amen. Jesus is that bridge. Amen. 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 That's when we entered into salvation. And what we were saved from, we were saved from sin, and not just sin, we were saved from its guilt, we were saved from its power, and we were saved from its defilement. Amen. That's right. All of those stages. Now, they, they might not seem, I see you looking kind of kind of blank-faced at me for a minute, uh, but those stages are significant. He saved us from sin. He saved us from the guilt of sin. He saved us from its power and its defilement. You're going to see how each one of those stages uh, uh, line up with the last four that we're dealing with today. And, uh, uh, and I'll bring that out just to, to uh, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. So write this down. Uh, and it will help us bring more understanding to the, to the picture. Number two, God has provided a total salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a total salvation that's provided for us in Jesus Christ. He didn't leave anything out that we might need. You see? We come into Christ with this salvation because of a crisis. A lot of times we meet him through a crisis. Uh, uh, we get to know him through a crisis. You come to the end of our rope, come to the end of ourselves. And then uh, we come to the beginning of Jesus. And uh, you know, a lot of times what happens is people feel brand new, and you are. You're a new creature in Christ, you know. You have a new, and you, you had a, your first encounter with God through Jesus Christ. You've come into salvation. But here's the thing, that salvation, although it, it, it solved one big problem in your life, and that's destination, where you're going to be when you die. But it also solves every little problem that you're going to face before you get to heaven. You see that? Uh, it bothers me when people receive Christ and, and, and they leave it off with, well, now you're ready to die. You know, you're ready to die. See, when you receive salvation through the scriptures, it wasn't that you were ready to die. Now you're ready to live. Amen, that's right. You see? He tells us to work this salvation out with fear and trembling. You know, we have to work out our salvation. I look at it like a care package. You know, if you're in a place and you're starving, you, got, you don't have any resources, and they send... Rescue, you know, the rescue missions come to you and they drop off care packages to you. Usually someone thought out what, what was needed from one end and they meet every need that everyone might possibly have uh, in a disastrous situation. So you drop off this care package and it's their salvation. In this care package, the salvation meets every need that they have, you see. It's their lifeline so that they can live and survive until things go back to normalcy, you see. Uh, you might need some toothpaste and some deodorant, as well as some diapers or some medication. And all of that is in the same care package. This is your salvation. You see? So what God did was he put everything that you would ever need in life, knowing you, he foreknew you, and knew what you would come across. But he gave you a total package in Jesus. When you receive him, you've received everything. You've received everything. But we grow into, into learning that. We don't realize that a lot of times when we first come in. You see, but God has provided, trust me, a, a total salvation through Jesus Christ, which brings us to number six. So what do we have so far? God called us. God saved us, number five. God called us, number four. He saved us, number five. Number six, he justified us. Mm -hmm. What your name said? He justified. He justified. He justified. See, God justified us. Now, how does this work? See, when we've been saved, when we have been saved, like I said, we're in the family of God now. Uh, now that we're in the family of God, God justifies us. He justifies us. That word, justify, it carries various meanings that all go together. It carries various meanings that all go together. Let me give it to you so that you'll see what I'm talking about. That word justify, it means to acquit. It means to reckon righteous. And it means to make righteous. To equip, to acquit, to reckon righteous, and to make righteous. That's what it means, okay? So through faith in Christ, 
God acquitted us of all guilt. Then he reckoned us righteous, and in the process of time, he's making us righteous. You get that? I'm going to let that dangle for a minute and marinate for a quick minute. Right, enough, enough marinate. Let me share this with you. See, see, God declared us righteous the minute we received Jesus. We're in right standing with God, not through anything that we do of our own, but through our faith in the finished work of Christ, we now are in right standing with God. That's what it means to be righteous. You're in right standing with God. I'm on the right side of the cross when I receive the gift of his son. And his son is our eternal life. So you can't say this. Eternal life is not a what, but a who. You see? He is my life. He's the life. He's the light of life. Uh, and he's the light of my salvation. He's the strength of my life. He's He's the eternal life himself who lives in me, you see? And it's not a length of days, it's a quality of days. Amen, that's right. You see? When you have eternal life, that doesn't mean you're going to live forever. It means that you're going to live forever with him with a different quality of life, you see? Everybody's going to live forever. It doesn't matter if you accept Jesus or not. You're going to live forever, you see? It's just a matter of destination, with or without him. You're going to live forever with him. And without it, you're going to live forever without it. You see what I mean? Uh, sin separating us from God, if we stay in that condition without receiving it, we're actually the walking dead. We're the walking dead. You're dead while you live. You're spiritually dead is the, is the condition. That's what it's called. Spiritually dead. You don't want to die spiritually dead. <laughs> you see? <clears throat> Being spiritually dead, it just means, it doesn't mean you don't exist. It means that you're separated from life himself. Amen. You see, if God is life himself and sin separates us from him, where does that lead you? you see, you're spiritually dead, spiritually cut off from life himself. And as you wander through life, cut off from life himself, you're in a dangerous position because tomorrow's not promised, promised to any of us. You see that? If you happen to die in that state, you'll be eternally separated from life himself. That means... It's damnation. It means hell. It doesn't mean that God wants you to go there. By the fact that he sent his son is proof that he doesn't want you to go there. <laughs> you see that? We go there then by default. That's what we do. We go there by default. It's not his fault that we end up there, but by default we go there. So he justifies us uh, once we come in. But now that we're justified, see, you still might be a baby Christian, carnal Christian, living by your senses. You're going to still mess up. You're going to fall. Does that mean that you've lost your salvation? No, it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. It means that you're, you're growing and you're learning what pleases him. You're getting your mind renewed. You're maturing in Christ. You Amen. See? You're maturing in Christ. And in the process of maturing in Christ, you're being made righteous at the same time. That's right. You see? You are righteous. You're being made righteous at the same time as you're pursuing him. Amen. I hope you're getting that. If you, if you don't, then just pull up that website that we're talking about and you'll be able, to, be able to take some further notes. But here's number seven. It brings us to number seven. Uh, four, he called us. Five, he saved us. Six, he justified us. But there's a problem with number six. A lot of times Christians stop at number six at being justified. But we got to move on. This is the challenge. We've got to move on to perfection. We've got to move on to number seven. He glorified us. He glorified us. Glorifies. I know that uh, um, you know. There's a saying, "Never despise a Pharisee." You know, or don't despise someone. See, if you despise something, you, it's possible to become what you despise. Uh, a lot of times, there, 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 there are a lot of young, young black men who grow up without fathers, and they may despise their fathers. And in the process of despising their fathers, they can become just like their father. Have the same results. Even doing something different, doing extremely different, and still producing the same results. You know, it's a generational curse. It's not just in black families, black cultures. It's just more common in black cultures. You know, being raised in a fatherless home, single parent home. You know, uh, but it, 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 it's the principle is still the same. It doesn't matter. It crosses, you know, cultural lines. Uh, without fathers, you know, uh, uh, you can't have bitter children. You can't have bitter sons. And a lot of times because of that, you, know, you can have the same result. You become just like the one you despise. You see? Uh, we can't despise a Pharisee or we'll become like one. And uh, uh, 
a lot of times, see, when you talk about religion, uh, religion keeps people from the life of God. Keeps people from the life of God. Uh, you come to life in God when you when you when you emphasize Jesus, uh, who is our life. It brings us on in. See, most Christians we stop at being justified uh, because we despise uh, those who emphasize the crucified Christ. I heard that before, where you, know, you see Jesus on a crucifixion. Like, Man, we don't worship a dead Jesus. We, we 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 celebrate a resurrected Jesus, and that is a graduation. From that, but see, here's where we become just like the one we despise. We stop short of where God really wants us to be, and that's glorified. He wants us to be glorified. See, that's the end result, the end game of God's plan for us. He glorified us, so we got to move on to being glorified. So, what does the Bible have to say about that? The Bible says that we are justified through the resurrection of Christ, but we are also glorified through the ascension. Of Christ. Amen, that's right. You see that? That's something that we haven't really paid much attention to is when he ascended to the right hand of the Father. You remember the scene. After his resurrection, he was uh, appearing and disappearing before his disciples over a period of 40 days. He was teaching them things about the kingdom. And at one point, he was seen by over 500 of his disciples at once. And these are eyewitness accounts to his resurrection. You see? Uh-oh. -uh. It wasn't until the 40th day that he goes to the Mount of Olives. And as he's giving the great commission to his disciples, all of a sudden, he starts rising up in the air. And they're watching him go up as he's talking to them. And the strange thing is, as he's going up, one of the last things that he says as he disappears is, Lo, I am with you always. <laughs> Isn't that strange? He disappears and says, I'm with you always. Mm -hmm. And as they finish gazing into the heavens, they didn't recognize that two angels appeared on either side of them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus that you've seen taken from you will return in like manner. You see? So now they go out rejoicing. Uh, and they witness Jesus' ascension. And that ascension is a supernatural account that we also identify with. Because if you identify with his death, you identify with his burial, you identify with his resurrection. Now you have to identify with the ascension. You see? And in the ascension, that tells us that we will be glorified. You see? We have the, uh, uh, the, the, the privilege of being taken up just like he was before uh, uh, the rapture even takes place. You see? This is a precursor of what we have to look forward to. He glorified us. Make note of this, that you and I are identified with Christ in each of those <coughs> aspects. In his death, he called us. In the burial, he saved us. In his resurrection, he justified us. And in his ascension, he glorified us. And what we're going to do in uh, next week's message, the Lord says the same. We're going to now look at these seven aspects or these seven stages in more detail. And uh, we're going to see what, what the Lord will have us pull out that we can use for later discussion. But I want to pray for you now. I want to pray that, that you answer the call. You answer the call. The call uh, is God's love calling you from this condemned world. And he's calling us into the family of God. He wants us to be, be in there. And it's an invitation. Isn't that nice? Amen. Isn't that sweet of it? He invites us to be a part of his family. And he wants to be our covenant father. So I'm going to pray for you right now where you are that you would make that decision to Make Jesus your Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your seven stage plan that you have for us. Thank you for calling us and thank you for saving us. Thank you for justifying us and glorifying us. We know that that plan is complete in your son, Jesus. So, Father, I pray for those who are hearing this message for the first time and with different ears that faith has come to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So, Father, I pray that you would grace them to make Jesus the Lord of their life, that they would make the confession that Jesus is Lord of all. And Father, I thank you for imparting into them your precious Holy Spirit that would bear witness with their spirit that they are now children of God. And I pray that you would fill them with your spirit so that they would be empowered to live out this life in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for those who have received. We thank you that they have received eternal life today. 
And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Any prayer requests that you might have today? I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, 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 an opportunity. You, we are we going to pray for your mom. We're going to pray for your mom. And if there are those who want to make a, if, you, if you're looking for a church home, I also want to give you an opportunity to make First, First Free Will Baptist your church home. We'd love to, to have you here join this local family uh, that we can all grow together in godliness. Uh, these people here love love each other. I really I can attest to that. Remember, I, I love the congregation so much. You know, uh, coming in, I believe God is doing something supernaturally here uh, with this particular church family. If you want to come and be a part of this particular church family, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come forward and make this your church home or stand where you are. If you have uh, 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 any kind, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit or uh, something like you've already received Jesus, but you need to receive the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues, feel free. Uh, we'll lay hands on you, let God do his thing, but your, your thing is to just simply believe and receive. Amen. Uh, any who have any needs like that? Anything? Brother Earl? I have a good afternoon to uh, First Free Will Baptist Church House. Everyone doing uh, this afternoon? Yeah. I'd like to be in prayer for our, uh, our president elect, the Republican Democratic uh, Party, you know, as far as you know, doing the right thing. And also, you know, for us not to have a spirit of fear, but God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a, a spirit of peace, love, and joy. And so, uh, and the word also tells us that greater than he is in us than he is in the world. So we want to keep them uplifted that, you know, right choices are made between the parties. You know, regardless of the Republican or Democratic Party, but doing and making the right choices. Amen. 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 Brady? Thank Whoever wins the um, yeah. election to be a godly man. Yeah. Believe right. in God. Yeah. Okay. Whoever, whoever does it, they just got to be a godly man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Or woman. 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 <laughs> right, right. Man, whoever's in office, we're going to pray that they be, that they be led by the Spirit of God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's what our job is as Christians. We pray for those in authority over us. You vote your conviction, vote, you know, because anything not done in faith is sin. Right. I mean, so if you feel it's a sin to vote for one and not the other, then yeah. don't go against your conviction. But whoever gets in office, take your place as a Christian. And let's pray together yeah. for those who are in authority, yeah. amen, over us, so that we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. That's yeah. 2 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, 2. That's right. Amen. amen. So that's what we're going to do today as well as pray for Brandon's mom. All right. Well, let's all stand together. Grab that person's hand next to you. Yes, get a connection. Okay, we, don't have to, we don't have to form a circle. Just grab the person's hand. As long as we connect somewhere, yeah. we'll grab it. Connect with somebody. Yeah, connect with her. Don't hold your own hand. Yeah. Okay. Don't do that. There we go. Amen. <laughs> All right. Let's do that. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for, for the right to pray. You've given us. Uh, the place in the body of Christ. You've given us a place in this earth as the body of Christ to pray, to act as kings and priests in this earth. So, Father, we, we take our place and we go before the elections right now. We pray for all those in authority over us and for whoever gets into that office, Father, we pray that you would give them a new spirit so that they can guide this country by your spirit and your wisdom. Father, we, we pray for protection for both parties that are, yes. that are running out right now for office. We pray for their care and their protection. Yes. We pray for safety for their families. Yes. Father, we pray that we would be able to get, get through these, these, uh, uh, these fiascos on, on television right now, that we can deal with issues uh, in this country, Father. We thank you that you are the God of this place. Yes. There are more than ten righteous in America. And, Father, we stand as just one of that group right now, that you would spare America. We thank you for that, Father, that you would relent and that you would cause us to repent and turn to you. For you said that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, you said, then would you hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So, Father, that's, our, that's what we decree today, and we, we pray. That's our request, and we believe we receive that. And we thank you for it. Father, we also lift up Braden's mama. 
And we thank you that you've already saved her. We pray that you would, you would take the veil off of her eyes. Yes. That she would see the glorious light of the gospel in Jesus Christ. Yes. And that she would make, make this into a testimony by yes, responding positively to your message. And we give you praise for her salvation. We just claim her for the kingdom right now because your blood already purchased her. And we give you praise, Father. And I pray for every individual here today at First Free Will Baptist that you would, you would empower us to walk out what we've experienced today, Father. Thank you that your word will not return void, but it will prosper in the very thing in which you've sent it. And we give you praise and honor, for In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Not used to holding hands, so we're. Yeah. 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 Y